all who believed were together in one place and had all things in common. Let us pray. And now, O Lord, sow the seed of thy word into our hearts and nurture it by thy grace as your word is proclaimed that it might bring forth abundant fruit for the living of these days through Christ our Lord. Amen. In Robbie Hooper's last Wednesday night class on the means of grace, she distributed some questions for our reflection and discussion. Great questions. In fact, if you're here, Robbie, I'd like to have a copy of those questions. But anyway, the thing that stood out as I read through those questions was how my answers would have been different if I had answered them 25 or 30 years ago. For example, one of the questions was, if you had all the time and all the money to do anything you wanted to do, what would it be? And so I thought, well, okay, 25 or 30 years ago, I'd probably want to move into the Hertz mansion and kick all those tourists out. Uh, I'd want to travel all over the world. I'd want to do all kinds of very exciting and pleasurable things. And I'm still not opposed to exciting and pleasurable things, particularly in contrast to painful and boring things. But, but I think today my answer would have to respond to the needs of others and to the pain of the world. Because I have learned something in the 35 or 40 years that I've been observing people like you. I really have been paying attention. And I've learned something from you and from people like you as I've tried to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And here's what I've learned. And I believe it with all my heart. Real joy comes in what we do for others. Real joy comes in what we do for others. Now, that's not something we immediately grasp when we become a Christian. It takes a little while to comprehend that fully. I'm not sure I still, you know, understand it as I should. But, you know, it was Jesus who said it's better to give than receive, right? Right? I remember when I was an undergraduate at Trevecca, I read an account of the death of General William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. And I had always admired William Booth for his theology, for his leadership, for his concern for the poor. And what I discovered is that William Booth's last three words was really one word repeated Three times it was the word others. Others, others, others. And I remember being tremendously inspired and also challenged by those words. I remember thinking, how in the world am I ever going to be that selfless? You know, how am I going to aspire to that kind of compassion and love for other people. Because I tell you what, by then I'd already decided that I would commit my life to the Christian ministry. I'd be a pastor. But you know, I also wanted to be maybe a little better pastor than some of my fellow students who would be competing for the same churches that I would be competing for in that called system. And that didn't feel all that spiritual, you know? And then also, while I had, had surrendered my musical talent, and, and, and that's loosely defined, while I had surrendered my musical talent to the Lord, I had noticed something. I noticed that when they asked me to sing in chapel or when my band played at the radio station's anniversary, we played out in different churches, 
that I always pulled out all the stops. And I tried to get the best musicians I could to, to play with me. And while I wanted to lift up Jesus Christ and share the gospel, I also wanted to look cool doing it. I realized that. But you know, General Booth seemed to take discipleship a degree or two above that. And so did the Christians in Acts chapter 2. The Christians who shared what they had with one another. I heard a pastor talk about his first big theological question. We all have big theological questions, right? And he said, I was just a little boy. And he said, at the time, I was, um, I, I, I had all of the state-of-the-art technological advances then available. It was a few years ago, and so, so one of those technological advances was a flannel graph board. Anybody remember flannel graph boards where you have the little, you know, they had Noah's Ark, and, the, and you could take the ark off the board or put the animals on the ark or off the ark, just state-of-the-art, high-tech stuff. And he said, and then we had a watercolor portrait of Pharaoh up to his ears and locusts and frogs and standing in a river that smelled like blood. But, but he said the most cool thing that we had was an actual replica of the walls around Jericho. And you could take the, the walls could come crumbling down and you could put them back up together again. And he said all of those Sunday school resources depicted the great miracles of the Bible, which led to, to his big theological question. His first theological question was, what was the hardest miracle for God? You know how a magician has his hardest trick? So he thought, well, God must have a miracle that was harder than all the others, and he tried to identify what it might be. He thought maybe it was the parting of the Red Sea during the Exodus. Maybe it was Jesus walking on the water. But he said, you know, as I've gotten older, if you can even use that kind of language for God in, 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 in terms of miracles and one being harder than the other. But he said, I think today maybe the greatest miracle is tucked away there in Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 45, when the Christians so loved each other they didn't distinguish between their own needs and the needs of others. That's a pretty big miracle, isn't it? They didn't distinguish between their own needs and the needs of their neighbors. They shared everything they had absolutely in common. Let's put verses 44 and 45 on the screen there. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Those early Christians loved one another the way a mother loves her child. And I know that there are exceptions to that. We read about them in the newspaper, but you know, for every example of some mother who didn't love her child the way God intends for the child to be loved. There's a million mothers who sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice. You know, my own, I remember my, own, my grandmother saying, Craig, have that last piece of chocolate cake. I don't want it. Have that last piece of chocolate cake. You know what I found out about my grandmother a little bit later? Nobody likes chocolate cake better than my grandmother. She loved chocolate cake, and she made pretty good chocolate cake, too. But compared to her love for me, chocolate cake, not that important. And then my mom sold her little red weekend BMW Beamer to help me buy a car for my son's college graduation. 
Did she love that little BMW? Yeah. Did she enjoy riding it? Yeah. But compared to her love for her grandson, it, it went away. That's the way the early church loved one another, the way a mom loves her child. Well, how do we begin to approximate that? A step at a time. And we celebrate every step we take towards it. Kind of like raising $2,000 for Project Transformation, which turned into $4,000 for Project Transformation, when our goal was $1,500. That's something worthy of celebration, isn't it? We do it by not allowing ourselves to be discouraged as we journey towards the goal of being Christ's disciples. We don't let ourselves be discouraged. I've told the, the, the story before about how one of my pastors told me how you can distinguish between the voice of the Lord and the voice of the devil. He said, when you hear a voice within you discouraging you, when you hear a voice within you that says, you're never going to measure up, you ever hear that voice or is it just me? Anybody else ever hear that voice? You are never going to measure up you're the most pitiful excuse as a Christian ever. And I know I'm not alone because John Wesley described feeling the exact way, the founder of Methodism. When you hear that voice say, you're unworthy, you're never going to measure up, why don't you just quit going to church? Why don't you just quit reading your Bible? Why don't you just quit praying? Because you're a spiritual failure. Big revelation, guess what? That voice is not from God. It's down there in that you know, other place. But when you hear a voice within you say, you're going to make it. Just take this next step towards being the person that I have you to be. That's the voice of the Lord. So I want to close with just a little story of, of my trying to listen to that voice and my trying to at least approximate a little bit of the kind of love that we see in the apostolic church. Uh, a few weeks ago now, I was part of the John Wesley Great Experiment. We had about 25 or 30 people involved in, in that program. There were two adult classes and a youth class, and it involved some disciplines. It involved tithing 10% uh, of your income and involved getting up at 5.30 in the morning to pray, to read your Bible, and then also to identify a good deed that you would do that day to someone, which was maybe the hardest part of all of that. And then uh, it, it, it involved finding a way to witness to what God was doing in your life. Well, about the end of the, of the program, I, uh, I bought a storage shed, you know, a used storage shed on Craigslist. I could put your lawnmowers in and rakes and shovels and all that kind of thing. It was used. So I went out to Smyrna to, to take a look at it. A young guy had it for sale. And I managed to convince him to sell it for less than he was offering it. Because that's what you do when you buy something on Craigslist, right? It's the way it works. And, um, but the, the young guy just incredibly impressed me. And what he said was, I was ready to write him a check right there and say, I'll, you know, I'll pick it up in a couple days. I have a couple options on coming and getting it. And he said, look, he said, I'll hold it for you. Make sure you can pick it up, and then you can pay for it then. I thought that's, you know, usually people are ready to take your money just as soon as you're ready to write the check, right? I was impressed. So 5.30 the next morning rolled around, Dr. Mullins. And I, read, I prayed, and I read my Bible, and, and then I was focusing on that question. What good deed shall I do today? I heard this voice, this quiet voice inside me say, you could pay full price for that shed. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. I just 
took a young preacher out to lunch, paid for lunch, and bought him a gospel CD. What am I, Mr. Moneybags, all of a sudden? And the boy said, no, look, 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 look. it could not only be your act of kindness for the day, it could be your witness, because he knew, you know, he knows you're a pastor. Besides that, you can put it on the, you know, Methodist letterhead and everything. I still wasn't convinced. But then that voice inside me said, now, why is he selling this shed? I was like, well, he's selling the shed because they're moving from that house, which they were renting, to an apartment so that they could save money to buy a house. And then that voice said, did you see anything else? And I said, I don't ask that question. No, did you see anything else? Well, yeah, I saw his wife rocking their baby. And then the voice said, don't you want to help? Yes, I want to. I'm going to write the check for the full amount. Okay, no moss, no moss, no moss. I'll write the check. And I did. And I know that that's a far cry from Acts chapter 2. I know that. And I, and I know that it's maybe a, a, a far cry from William Booth's others, others, others. But every step that we can take towards loving somebody the way the early church loved one another and the way a mother loves her child is a good step. And don't let anybody tell you any differently. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.